out there. <laughs> I don't know why it... Okay, I'm going to try this one more time, very gently. Am I still on? All right. Okay, let's try this again. How's everybody feeling? <laughs> All right, let's stand up. Let's just get a little bit, I don't know, just more energy going because it just feels a little um, chill, maybe too much zen or something. Um, you know what I mean? So I don't know. Shall we do the hokey pokey? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so just stretch your arms up if you, if you don't mind, you know, just participating. Kind of roll your neck around a little bit. Take some deep breaths. Give me an amen. <laughs> and let's pray. So, Lord, we bless you. Thank you for your presence. The Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence expanding and awakening us. We ask today for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And we thank you that we are growing and awakening and being empowered. Amen. You can be seated. So, we've been talking about this whole concept of uh, Venus, the planet Venus and its place that it has uh, for us in the Bible. In the Greek... The word that gets translated, <clears throat> I mean, the Greek word, not the word that gets, well, yeah, I guess it is that too. The Greek word is phosphorus. Phosphorus uh, was a Greek mythological character who was a light bearer, who was the torch bringer, who was the herald of the new day. So it gets translated in our Bibles as morning star, son of the morning, things like that. The Latin translation of the Greek word phosphorus is the word Lucifer. So because of the way Christian teaching has evolved over the last several centuries, really since the second century, when you talk about Lucifer, people think you're talking about the devil. And most people don't know that Lucifer, Phosphorus, or Venus is a title that's used for Jesus in the book of Revelation, and that we are actually told in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, that Venus, or Lucifer, needs to rise in our heart. <laughs> Until the day dawns and Venus, this light, rises within us. So that's kind of context for where we're at and where we're staying. Um, but I'm going to look at something, uh, a couple things. And I'm more in the teacher mode. I've been in a preacher mode the last couple weeks, but I'm, I'm more teacher mode this morning. So bear with me. John chapter 1, verse 1, we'll just read from here. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now watch this, really important. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So all things find their origin in the Logos, right? In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in in the darkness, everybody say in the darkness. darkness. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not comprehend it. And then he goes on and says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness to the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Watch this. That was the true light, which gives light to every person coming into the world. Just notice every person, right? He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor, uh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, John's gospel is absolutely brilliant. But to understand it, you have to really understand what's going on in the prologue here. Our translations are terrible. I, I've done this before. I don't want to spend a lot of time proving this. 
uh, somewhere in the archives there's messages where I've painstakingly gone through this, but where the translation really is crummy <laughs> is verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word should not be translated as among because everywhere else in the Greek, it's translated within. And if you have a good, honest Bible, it will have a footnote by it, and you'll look in the margins, and it'll say, or within. There's one other place this word gets translated among in some Bibles. It's in Luke chapter 17, where Jesus said, the kingdom does not come with observation, but the kingdom of God is within you. But our translators didn't like that translation either, so they made it among you. Because what they're doing is they're coming from this frame that makes Christ, Logos, and Jesus something separate and other than you, something outside of you. But if we were reading it in its original translation, it would say the word became flesh and dwelt within you. And then here's the key. And we beheld his glory. Where then are you beholding the glory of the only begotten son? Not outside yourself, within yourself. That's the frame through which we are invited into the story that John tells about Jesus. So the next thing that happens in John chapter 1, or, or kind of the last thing that happens, th this is so cool when you can see this, there are two disciples that go and start following Jesus, and they ask Jesus, where do you abide? Now your translation says, where do you live? But same thing, it's in the Greek it's abide, but it could be the same thing. Where do you live? And what does he say? He says to them, come and see. Now, connect that with beholding the glory. You got it? So, he is the light that gives light to every person who comes into the world, which means you do not come into the world rotten to the core. You do not come in as a sinner. You do not come in with, with whatever that... that <laughs> Be nice today, Aaron. Be nice. <laughs> it's all BS. You actually come in with the light of Christ. Every person coming into the world comes in with the light of Christ. That is Venus. That is that Lucifer or that light that needs to shine forth. That is unique for each person, but not separate or other than the Logos or Christ. And this is the whole point of John's gospel. So when he says, wh where do you dwell? And he says, come and see. And then by the time you get to the end of the chapter, he starts talking about the dwelling of himself and God in you. John 15, for example, if, I, if you abide in me, I will abide in you and you will bring forth much fruit. It's the same word. Where do you live? So the whole point of John's gospel is for you to see that you are the abiding place, the house of God. In my father's house, there are many mansions. The point is you're one of those mansions. That's the whole point of the book. Now, here's the other thing that he does that's just brilliant. He repeatedly tells stories to let you know if you, if you interpret it literally, you're missing the whole point. Repeatedly. For example, one we're probably all familiar with in John chapter 3, he comes to Nicodemus and says, <laughs> unless a man is born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And what does Nicodemus say? How can I enter into my mother's womb again? So Jesus says, you're taking it literally, you're missing the point. At another point, he comes down and says, I am the bread from heaven. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, and they all got offended because they thought he was teaching cannibalism. He goes to the woman at the well. She's at a literal well. He says, if you drink the water that I give you, you'll never thirst. And she says, where can I get this water? Right. So see, he, he's drawing the distinction that every time you try to take it literally as a reality that is outside yourself, you're completely missing it. So this whole thing is woven into the gospel of John. Got it? But here's the key. The light shines in the darkness, not separate from the darkness. Right. 
God told Abraham, your seed will be like the stars of the sky. When do the stars shine? At night. Right. So you have light and darkness together. Now, when do you see Venus? Twilight. Twilight. What is twilight? Twilight is the bridge, the transition, or the place where you have light and darkness blended together. And so that tells us something very powerful about ourselves. So here's our problem. Uh, we don't know where our belief systems come from. We don't realize how embedded they are into our presuppositions and how much they're affecting our worldview. Right. People just assume that somehow the Bible, I don't know, I mean, I really don't know, like was dictated from heaven, audible voice, and somebody said, this is what's supposed to be in there, and boom, there it is. Most people are completely ignorant of the fact that it was 400 years later that the canon of Scripture, and the word canon there means measure, that, 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 that a group of people decided these are the books that, here's the thing, they never, those guys never said the Bible was the authority. Their tradition was the authority. So they deliberately chose books that supported their 400-year-old tradition. And they deliberately left out books that would cause you to lose your dependency upon the state and the church. And it wasn't until the Reformation, when Martin Luther and those guys, several centuries after that, needed a new authority because they were no longer going to submit to the authority of the Pope so they came up with the scripture as the new authority. And so now we've inherited it today as though somehow it is the word of God forever settled in heaven. Without realizing where a lot of our beliefs come from. So our problem is this. Our number one problem is this. Dualism. Or we see things through a dualistic frame. This and that. Now, here's what I mean by dualism. Dualism is two completely separate, self-contained but opposing forces. Two completely separate, self-contained opposing forces. So, let's just use this one. Light and dark, right? Completely opposite, completely other than. Yeah. Right? Except not really. H how many have ever gone to uh, one of those caves where they turn out the lights so you can experience total darkness? Why would they need to do that? Why would that be an experience that someone's having? that's like cool to have because there aren't too many places where you can actually get total darkness because everything is a blend. But let's, let's work with this. So, so here's God, <laughs> the devil, right? Um, good, evil and these are complete the characteristics they don't share any characteristics that are the same Correct. and they are in complete opposition with one another and that's where we begin right, are you breathing are you sure? Then from that frame, we begin to categorize <laughs> to very different degrees, people, places, things, even ourselves. Um, even truth and a lie.
There's absolute truth, absolute lie. There's thesis, there's antithesis. If this is right, this can't be right. Are you tracking? Our prob- but here's the problem. God did not create or we do not live or exist in a dualistic world at all. It is merely a mental category. It is an absolute mental projection upon reality to think in dualistic terms and dualistic frames. What we actually experience instead of dualism is polarity. And polarity is a spectrum. It is a connected reality. So light and darkness. So when you're in the cave, you're at the total end of the polarity. As you emerge from the cave, as you go through your day, night, twilight, whatever, you're experiencing varying degrees along the spectrum. Thank you. <laughs> Am I breathing? I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> it's super hard to get out of this frame because it's so embedded in everything that we think, do, and experience. But it's a complete projection. Hot and cold is varying degrees of... All right, here's a polarity. Male and female. So... Take male and female and try this. Right? Right? I mean, just human beings, are we completely other than? Are we totally self-contained and completely other than and don't share any characteristics with each other because we're men and women? Some people think so. (laughs) The truth is that the church also created this dualistic frame between men and women. From a certain perspective, the garden story is the overthrowing of the divine feminine energy because in the ancient world, it was the goddess energy that was the mother of all living, which is the title that's given to Eve. In the ancient world, the tree that came up from the ground was connected to Mother Earth and expressions of the feminine energy, and the serpent, because it crawled so close to Mother Earth, was another representation of feminine energy. So the evil in the story is the tree, the woman, and the serpent. Wow. And when you understand that the scriptures were assembled with a political motivation under one of the kings of Judah. (laughs) Yes. I hate to tell you this, but uh, archaeology now shows that in ancient Israel, Asherah was viewed as Yahweh's wife. And Israel, the ten tribes, worshipped in that way. And there was competition between Jerusalem and Judah and Israel. And so when Judah to come into power, they had to overthrow the divine feminine. Thus you have your story of the Garden of Eden. But see, we don't, we don't know where this stuff comes from. We just think it fell out of heaven from God, and there it is. Are you breathing? So the early church did this, though. They said women were the most disgusting and vile of all creatures, that they were the daughters of Eve and all of them being the daughters of hell. The Jewish culture of that day said it was better to burn the Torah than to teach it to a woman. But somehow we feel beholden to all these (laughs) things. We hide that stuff. Like nobody, nobody's preaching that today. 
Like nobody that's going back to the Jewish roots is pulling out the Talmud and saying it's better to burn the Torah than teach it to a woman. They, they just leave that part out. They just quote the parts that are convenient for whatever doctrine they want to prop up. So let's step out of this and let's come back to nature. Let's just come back to nature. Now, because see, here's the thing. So even, even the Apostle Paul, a lot of Christian mystics and stuff, they said you can get to know God by getting to know nature. That if you look at nature, it's a, if you want to know the creator, you can look at creation. Right. Yes? Yes. Here's the thing. So let's, let's just say you have two revelations. Let's say you have the revelation of scripture that reveals God and you have the revelation of nature. Which one's more direct? Which one came directly from God and which one came through the mediation of human beings. Right, right, exactly. So which one might be a more accurate picture? Seems logical, doesn't it? So if polarities don't, I mean, polarities exist, but duality does not exist in nature. Now let's apply this to good and evil. We talked about serpents. The serpent finds a family of mice and devours Papa Mouse. Was he doing that with evil intention? Was he wicked? Was the serpent evil and the mice were... Okay, some people think the serpent's evil. All right, because you had too much Sunday school growing up. So let's, so let's try something else. Um, let's try something else. The lion... comes upon a family of gazelles and eats one of the babies. Is the lion inherently evil? Is the gazelle inherently good? Depends on your perspective. To the lion, it's good. <laughs> to papa gazelle, maybe not so much. Or mama gazelle, maybe not so much. It's evil. But objectively... Does good or evil exist? It's perspective, it's perception. If you eat at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be opened and you'll become like God knowing good and evil. Now here's what, here's, can, I, can I just mess up something else for you? <laughs> if you go back and look at the story, the serpent said you'll become as God knowing good and evil and God says at the end of chapter 3 behold man has become our text says as one of us so everybody that says oh well, you're following that new age stuff and you're just believing the lie of the serpent that you can be as God I guess they just marked that part where God confirmed what the serpent said out of their Bible but it actually doesn't say he became as one of us <sighs> it's the word echad he became echad, and it means he became a united whole, knowing good and evil. Ooh, that's tough. See, Venus, <laughs> you guys are looking at me. <laughs> it's hilarious. Venus shines at twilight. The light of Christ shines in the darkness. <laughs> so let's do this. How, how's our time? How's our time? Yeah. yeah, I'll run you through this real quick, and then I'll probably have to come back and edit because people will be like, what? I'll do it really fast. There's a verse, a couple of verses in the Bible where it says, God says, Jacob, we're going to talk about Jacob and Esau for a minute. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, um, I'm, I'm not going to look at the scriptures, take too, too much time, but you can, it's in the Genesis. I don't, I don't remember the chapters, 27 or something like that. Isaac is the seed of Abraham. Now, remember, everything in the Bible, like, these aren't 
there's no value in these being historical, literal stories unless you're a Zionist or a, or a Jewish nationalist. And then you can draw from your history and say, we have the right to the land. But other than that, there's, there's no value in the historical teaching for us. And I don't think that's why the ancient people told those stories anyway. I think the real power of it is to be able to get a revelation of what's happening inside of you, that each character represents an aspect of you or a state of consciousness right. yes. that abides within you. And so when you engage with the scriptures in that way, then it becomes a powerful tool that speaks to your spiritual potentials and opens up your own divine expression or gives you the power for the day star to rise in your heart. Okay? So Jacob and Esau, the, the whole story are parts of us. They're twins. As soon as Rebecca gets pregnant, she fills them, watch this, wrestling, yes. it's very important, wrestling together in the womb. When they come out, they're linked because Jacob is holding on to his heel. <laughs> they're complete polarities because as soon as they're born, Esau is hairy. Can you imagine what a shock that must have been? <laughs> I just gave birth to Sasquatch. But watch, watch how it does this. It says when Esau was born, that he was hairy, that he was a man of the field, that he was a hunter, and that Isaac loved Esau. Jacob comes out. He's not hairy. We know later because when he's stealing the blessing, he's got to put the animal skins on his arms so his dad will think it's Esau. And he's a mild person, soft, effeminate. And he stayed close to the home. And it says, yeah, it says Rebecca loved Jacob. So right away, what you're seeing is twins, two people existing in two different ends of a polarity spectrum and they're fighting with each other does this sound familiar to anybody's struggle right. <laughs> obviously if you want if you want to just look at it from the divine masculine and divine feminine obviously then Esau represents the masculine because He's daddy's boy. And Jacob represents the divine feminine because he's mama's boy. And particularly in that culture, remember, it was Esau who brought the meat back and it was Jacob who cooked it up. <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> it was Jacob that gave Joseph the coat of many colors. Think about that one. <laughs> His favored son. You see it? So then what happens? There's a war between them, and Jacob takes off, but Esau is chasing him. So much of what Jacob's journey is, is it's a journey where he's running from Esau. Right? Finally, Esau catches up with him. And to prepare for his meeting with Esau, because he doesn't know that maybe Esau is going to kill him, he crosses a river called Jabbok, and it says he wrestled with an angel all night long. Oh, I wish we knew how to read the scriptures. The fact that he's wrestling with the angel is so that you, the reader, will connect it back to him wrestling with Esau in the womb. The fact, thank you, the fact that he's wrestling with the angel is so as you're reading the story, you will make the connection between the wrestling and the womb. Woo. 
When you understand Esau is not a separate entity, Esau is a part of Ju- of Jacob, then the wrestling that he's doing is really he's wrestling with himself. Now here's where it gets interesting because in other places, God says, Jacob, I have loved, but Esau, I have hated. So <laughs> from the monster God frame, then God's just up there picking and choosing and creates some people for wrath and destruction and some people for salvation. And I mean, he's just this megalomaniac monster, totalitarian, evil ruler. Well, right. or there's a deeper truth here. So if you look at this, now come back to the lens of John, if you look at this and realize that Christ is the light that gives light to every person that comes into the world, that you actually are divine. You, you're not separate from God. You are not other than God, and God is not outside of you. So then it, it can be... Come on. So when he says, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated, who is he talking about? He's talking about your own divine consciousness wrestling in this world of polarity and dividing your energies with certain parts or things that you love and uphold and think you're supposed to be and certain things about yourself that you hate and detest and you spend your days wrestling with those things trying to figure out who's going to get the supremacy and all too often what you give birth to is the things you hate while the things you love are grabbing onto the heel saying, no, wait, from what about me? Until eventually we suppress those things so deeply in our own psyche that we try to run from them because we do this duality thing in and of ourselves because we think I have to have all these good characteristics. I have to be only light. I have to be only divine. I have to be only spirit, and I can't have any of these things over here. So you, you talk to somebody that's raised in this stuff, and they can suffer the worst kind of victimization and have no avenues, even within their own consciousness, to process their own pain because God said, If you don't forgive other people their trespasses, he's not going to forgive you yours. And so they don't even have room to recover as victims and to be angry and to feel hate and to set boundaries and feel anger or have aggression or whatever. Because they're so busy denying those aspects of because that's Esau. And I've got to be this perfect, loving, turn-the-other-cheek, light-bearing. And it's not just Christians. Uh, People in the metaphysical world are worse about this than Christians. They are, because they want to eradicate their ego. We're just light and life, and we just love everybody. No, you don't. You don't. You're you're, you're going to a Halloween party (laughs) where we're all pretending. It's just the truth. So you don't want to get out of one ditch and fall into the other one because you're both are operating out of the dualistic frame. So Jacob represents a part of us that tries to be a good person. Esau represents the wild us, the nature us, the man of the field, the animal nature, the hairy one with all the urges and to hunt and be a predator and Whatever else. Right. You got, yeah, you see it? And so we're like, oh, we can't have that. We've got to be divine. Jacob's divine. Jacob's divine. Jacob's the, Jacob's the tame one. He's the, he's the mild one. He's the one we can deal with because he's more mild. The, the, there's not the fiery passion in Jacob. There's the fiery passion in Esau that we can't seem to tame. But Jacob's easy to tame because he's mild. Jacob's easy to tame because he's domesticated. So we love Jacob. So we're, gonna, we're just going to try to be Jacob. And we're going to run from Esau until finally you can't run anymore. And then the fight is on. 
Now, not only, so context of story, not only are we supposed to connect the angel that Jacob is wrestling with with his wrestling in the womb, but when it's finally over, and I'll get to that in a second, but I need to throw this out right now. When it's finally over, Jacob looks at, he, 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 he names the place where he was, Peniel, because he says, I have seen God face to face and survived. In other words, he says, when I was wrestling, I saw the face of God. The next day, Jacob goes out to meet Esau, and the two brothers come together, and they are reconciled. And you know what the first thing is that Jacob says to Esau? Does any, can anybody guess? Really? He says, seeing you is like seeing the face of God. Wow. <laughs> so you connect it back with the wrestling, and you connect it forward with, he saw the face of God in the evening, or at night, and then he tells Esau, when he loves Esau, when he bows down to Esau, and when he gives his wealth to Esau. I know I'm hearing like the Jeopardy music in my head. Here's the other really cool part. You ready for this? He wrestles with the angel until twilight. Until dawn. In the Hebrew, it says, until the breaking of the darkness. The time of the morning star. Here's the part we're not going to like. <laughs> Jacob loses the wrestling match. <laughs> Esau gets him in the hip, and he becomes weakened, and he walks with a limp for the rest of his life. Because until we can learn to join ourselves to the parts of ourselves that we hate and embrace their energies to the point that they weaken our need to be perfect and good and dualistic, we will never find our light and we will never be able to blend The polarities so powerful and find our balance and if we don't find our balance we don't find our light all we do is live inside the programming because you see most of what we love initially most of our Jacob is simply the byproduct of the social engineering and programming that we were born into and that is the very thing that if we are going to ascend, we have to be able to throw off. That those are the very stars above which we must ascend. Those are the very clouds that we must penetrate through and rise above if we are going to be light bearers and allow our light to shine. And so where I find my place on the spectrum of polarities may be totally different than where you find your place on the spectrum of polarities. And I cannot adjust my movement because I'm other referencing rather than self-referencing. Because the moment that I'm self-referencing, I mean, I'm sorry, the moment I'm other referencing, you just became my Lord and my dictator. You just became a star that has exalted itself above me. And I will never find my spectrum until I, my place in the, in the spectrum, my place in the polarities, until I'm willing to embrace the parts of me that I hate, until I'm willing to put, uh, embrace the parts that I say are evil, until I'm willing to embrace the spark of inspiration and energy and power that comes from the Esau parts of me. See, what you don't realize is that Esau is where your power is. 
and that in many ways your Esau is healthier than your Jacob. That what is making you sick mentally and emotionally is the internal pressure to live this dualistic life where you're this perfect, shining, wonderful individual with no humanity and no urges <laughs> and no drive. And, and see, but, but see, here's the thing. Also, in, in Esau is, is the wounding. And so at some point, Jacob has to recognize that through this struggle, I've been wounded. And I may walk with a limp for the rest of my life. And I got to be content to say, okay, I'm doing my best to be. <sighs> See, the thing is, he's no longer Jacob. When he wrestles, he says, what is your name? And he says, my name is Jacob. And the angel tells him, you shall no longer be called Jacob. <sighs> your name shall be called Israel because you have wrestled with God and with man and you have prevailed. In other words, there is a complete transformation and a whole new person that emerges. Not a person who is a polarity or stuck in a polarity, but at twilight, at the breaking of the darkness, when he sees God face to face, when he becomes weakened by his own shadow self, when he feels the pain of his own life, at the moment when Venus rises, he gets a new name. I could also say at the moment that w w we can go into this, the masculine and feminine energies become blended. You become echt hot, as one. And then it's okay. It's okay that you got crap. It's okay that you walk with a limp. <laughs> and you realize there is nothing, where I'm going to close, there is nothing inherently one or the other. There is nothing inherently good or evil. Do you have to eat to live? What do you eat that does not die? So in death there is life, and in life there is death. Just the way it is, <laughs> yeah. The same medicine that will heal your body can also kill you. The vaccine is the germ that can kill you, but it's just enough to make you immune. And living within that tension is what it takes to become Israel. done i'm still doing this lucifer series should i call it the luciferian gospel <laughs> the luciferian gospel of jesus christ man would they label us a cult or what oh my god i actually had somebody on on one of my social media sites say i pray for your safety because i'm really afraid people are th like are gonna want to kill you i doubt it they just think i'm crazy <laughs> Did this help you? I, ho I hope this helped you. Yeah. All right. Have a very blessed day. Um, and uh, we'll see you next week, I hope. God bless you.